Welcome to our 22nd episode of Two Tankers and a Cat. We are your host, I'm Charlie. And this is Russell. Um, I guess our first announcement should be what we're talking about today. Uh, the Tiger Tank 712 that's down in Fort Benning that me and you surpri- oh. surprisingly found. Yep, yep. Um, there's a GoFundMe. And uh, the guy is trying to raise money, and the guy is actually out of Lee Summit, Missouri. Sweet. He, he's just right down the road from us. Oh, that is cool. Um, so he is trying to raise the money uh, for the Armored Calvary Foundation, and they are going to try to get the Tiger 712 cleaned up and looking wow. looking pretty. That, that'd be really nice, yeah. Because uh, even though me and Russ just accidentally found it, and if it wasn't for Rob Cogan, uh, we wouldn't even have seen it. Yeah, very true. So, Thank you, Rob. Yeah. It, it, <laughs> it, it's actually funny. I've got a video uh, where I was just taping for my own personal Facebook, and uh, me and Russ are looking at a T3485. And I was like, oh, my God, this is great. You know, this is awesome. And uh, we're around, looking around, and I look, and there's, uh, I mean, I know the Tiger Tank. There's the ass end of a tiger. And Rob is telling us about the T-34, and I, I, I stop him. I'm like, is that a tiger tank? And he goes, yeah, that's Tiger 712. Wow. And I'm like, I didn't think there were any tigers in the United States. And he goes, it's right there. I ran over and just started rolling on it, and Russ was like, this is great. Truly incredible, man. That was a good day. But now they want to get it you know, looking good enough where they can actually bring the open houses. Um, oh, yeah. You need to actually follow the Tank or Armored Calvary Foundation. Well, okay, yeah. Russ, what's the real name of it? Yeah, it's the National Armor and Calvary Heritage Foundation uh, out of Columbus, Georgia. You can find them on the Internet at armorcalvaryheritagefoundation.org. Dot .org just do a search for the Armor Calvary Heritage Foundation dot .org and Google or your search engine and bring that up. Um, they're the ones kind of raising the money to get the museum and everything going down there and and fixing up a lot of this stuff and pretty sweet organization. Glad they're out there. Uh, no doubt. And uh, I actually talked to Rob uh, the other day and he has 50 tanks waiting for him to find a place for them. Sweet. Yeah, but the problem is, one of them is a Jag Panther. I said, wait, you mean the one for, in Bovington? Or? He goes, no, we have our own Jag Panther. And I'm like, well, next thing you're going to be telling me is we got, like, other German tanks. And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we do. We just yeah. don't have a place to put them. Yeah, their collection down there is just incredible. It is just beyond words to tank enthusiasts like us. We haven't set it up yet, but I am going to probably post on our Facebook um, a way that we can actually write a letter to President Donald Trump. Believe it or not, you can send an email to him. We're going to do a format. We're going to do it really good. And we're going to ask him to pay attention to this, these national treasures. Because they're starting to fall apart. Yeah, very true. They need work and the, and the funding there to, to make all this work out. One of the saddest stories I heard is one of the vicars that's waiting to come down the bottom's rusted out, and the engine has fell on the ground. Oh, wow. And, and we've got to save these yeah, tanks, yeah. ladies and gentlemen. And, and we're going to, you know, like I said, we're going to put on, on our Facebook an exactly step-by-step at where you know, where the link is to the president's office. Um, we're going to ask you to be very cool. Even if you don't agree with his politics, or you do, we want you to bring this aware room. And if we get, yeah. you know, the thousands of yeah. followers that we have to send these true, in, true. And w- with a certain subject line, yeah. maybe, hey. you know, we'll roll the dice. And see hey, it. might as well. It's worth a try, man. Yep. But from right now, we're, uh, we're going to also link up... Uh, the site to the GoFundMe that'll be on our Patreon page and our homepage and our Facebook page. Yes. Oh, talking about PayPal, I wanted to give a, a shout out to uh, Kurt up there in uh, Montana. You know, big our, state of Montana. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Cowboy MT that we always talk about. Talking about a man in Montana mountains. He is ten foot tall. And oh proof. wow. And uh, he he funded us on PayPal. And, yes. Uh, that's great. Uh, very very grateful to you, Kurt. Thank you. 
And who are our Patreon shout-outs this week? Yeah, we've got uh, Andy Crow at the M3 Stewart level, uh, Rick Smith. He's at the M4 Sherman level, and we've got three patrons at the M1 Abrams level, uh, Kyler Montgomery, Kevin Chin, and and Mark Drake. And if you haven't found us on Patreon yet, uh, get out there, check it out. Uh, We're going to be adding some more content to it here shortly. Find it at www.patreon.com backslash two tankers and cat. Yeah, because believe it or not, uh, our costs have actually went up um, for our equipment, uh, as you can tell, our sound has gotten a lot better since when we started. Yes. And uh, we're just asking you to throw us a couple of bucks. Yep, that's and, uh, it. Uh, I, I, Stewart's, what, $2? Yeah. Herman's 4 Yeah. Abrams, 8 it, it helps a lot. Yeah, you guys out there have no idea how much it helps to have you backing us that way. It, as you all know, that we are police officers, and uh, I know everybody says, oh, well, cops out in Los Angeles, you know, make tons of money. I'm like, <laughs> well, we're in Kansas, and we yeah, don't make a ton we, of money. We don't make what they make out there, no. Uh, let's get back on point. Um, our first key point is going to be the Tiger 7112 and, of course, the effort to save it. And our second point is going to be the Tiger tank. Russ, the Tiger has bu- been done to death. I mean, that's one of the reasons we've waited so long to do the Tiger episode. There's just tons and tons of stuff on the tiger, and uh, but we want to wear, uh, we want to raise awareness of the oldest tiger tank known in existence, and that's the Tiger Tank 712. Now everybody says, well, no, no, Tiger 131. No, that's the only one that's still functional. Yes, it, it moves. Yes, but the oldest Tiger tank that you know that we're known of is the Tiger 712, which we have down in Fort Benning. Now that is a national treasure. Very much so, yes. Let's go over the Tiger history first. Uh, Russ, tell us a little bit about the Tiger. The Tiger I, or the Panzerkampfwagen Tiger Ossif E, was born in May 1942, but its conception and development can be traced directly back to 1936 and 1937 with work on a 30- to 33-ton tank by the firm of Hinchel Unson in Kassel. The tank was given its nickname Tiger by Ferdinand Porsche, and the Roman numeral was added after the late Tiger II entered production. The initial designation was Panzerkampfwagen 6 version H, which was also abbreviated Ossif H, where H denoted Hinchel as the designer and manufacturer. It was classified with Ordnance Inventory Designation SDKFZ 182. The tank was later redesigned as Panzerkampfwagen 6 Ossif E in March of 1943 with Ordnance Inventory designation SDKFZ 181. I know the gun was the 88 or 8.8 centimeter uh, KWK 36 uh, which was basically an 88 millimeter tank gun used by the German army uh, during World War II. This was the flat gun. Uh, this was the primary arm of the Tiger uh, tank and it was developed by Krupp, wasn't it? Yes. The gun was derived from the 8.8 centimeter Flak 18 and the Flak 36 gun and delivered similar ballistic performance. So here's a pretty good idea. Let's get an air, let's get a gun that's shooting down airplanes and put it on a tank. Heck yeah, we'll give it a try. That's awesome. Might as well. Uh, you know, uh, everybody says that we don't like, you know, the German tanks. And I'm like, well, yes, we do. Oh, we yeah. love the yes. German tanks. Yes, the Tigers, the Panther is one of the sexiest tanks I've ever saw in my life. The Tiger was the very first model I ever yeah. put together. Yeah. Tiger's just a beast, man. Yeah. But it, it, it had problems. It had some problems, yes. Well, let's talk about the production history. Yeah, it was the Tiger tank was designed by Erwin Aders. Hinchel and Son, uh, designed between 1938 and 1941, and designed by the manufacturer was actually Hinchel. Yeah, in German currency, it was about 250800 That's the uh, Reichmarks, I Reichmarks. think. Reichmarks, yeah, okay. Reichmarks. But yeah, 250 yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll pay yeah. that for a new t- Tiger. We'll have to call them up and ask them if they still build them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was produced between 1942 and 1944, and there was about 1,350 of them built. How heavy are these things? Yeah, the normal Tiger tank without any extra stuff put on it was about 54 tons or 60 short tons. The Ossif E at combat weight was about 57 tons or 63 short tons. Oh, that's pretty heavy. That's a pretty thick tank. Yeah, it sure is. So what were were the other stats like length and width and height? Yeah, they were about 6.316 meters 
long or 20 foot 8.7 inches long uh, including the gun they were about 8.45 meters long or 27 feet 9 inches now that's from the tip of the t- gun to the back of the tank to the back of the tank yes okay yes the width was about 3.56 meters wide or 11 foot 8 inches that's a lot of yeah, steel. That's yeah. a lot of steel, brother. It's a big, big machine. About three meters high or nine foot ten inches high. Still shorter than the Lee. Still shorter than our Lee, man. <laughs> I swear, I don't know if we can find one. That... <laughs> hey, um, what kind of crew did it have for such a big, heavy tank? Had five crew members. Had the commander, a gunner, a loader, a driver, and an assistant driver. Right. So dang big, it took an assistant driver, man. The armor on the Tiger was anywhere from 25 to 120 millimeters, or 0.98 inches to 4.72 inches thick. That, that uh, 25 millimeters has got to be the commander's hatch. Yeah. Well, tell, tell us about the uh, main armament, even though we've talked about it a little bit. Yeah, the main armament, it had one 8.8 centimeter kwk 36 l slash 56 main gun they carried 92 ap and he rounds inside the tank so just armor piercing and he yeah yeah the secondary armament included two 7.92 millimeter mg 34 machine guns 4500 rounds how many rounds they carried in the tank for that particular machine guns uh or about 4800 rounds in the osif e that's the one with the combat and yeah okay what kind of engine did it have? Had the Maybach HL230 P45 V12 engine and about 690 horsepower. Wow, 690 horsepower. Yeah. Okay, what was the power to weight ratio? Yeah, the power to weight ratio was about 13 PS per ton. Uh, the suspension was actually a torsion bar suspension system and it had a ground clearance of about point four seven meters or one foot seven inches. So it had some decent ground clearance. All right. Well, what was the operational ro- uh, range? Yeah, on the road, uh, about 195 kilometers or 121 miles. Or cross country had a range of about 110 kilometers or 68 miles. All right. So what kind of speed was it going? Uh, road speed was about 45.4 kilometers an hour or 28.2 miles per hour. And it could sustain a road speed of about 40 kilometers an hour or 25 miles per hour. Yeah, and cross country, the speeds would range about 20 to 25 kilometers an hour, 12 to 16 miles per hour. So not a real fast tank. No, not with that much weight. No, no. <laughs> it, it's kind of like me, even though I weigh quite a bit. I, I know, I'm kind of a tank. I'm, a, I'm slow, but I, I can get it done. Okay, let's talk about uh, the 712 at Fort Benning. When we saw it and we, i know you were there and we freaked out and we went around they had cut the sides out of it and uh, the reason they cut the sides out of it because they had to use it as a training tool there were guys that were wanting to scrap this but the guy the curator at the time said hey listen i'm going to use this as a training tool and i'm going to cut out half the turret and stuff and so yeah. the guys can come up and see what the german tank was and they're like oh well, if you're going to use it as a training tool, well, you can keep it. And, and I'm like, we, we've got to get these tanks in protection. Oh, yeah. Russ, I know you know some of the history of the 712. Well, let's get into the 712's uh, history. Yeah, this particular Tiger tank has generated more discussion and controversy than any other preserved historic vehicle and is probably the most traveled. Uh, built in Germany, it was shipped to France and then North Africa and was captured by the U.S. forces and then sent to the United States, where it was part of the Ordnance Museum at Aberdeen Proving Grounds in Maryland. In 1989, it was transferred to the Auto and Technic Museum in Sinsheim, Germany, on a 10-year loan, and exhibited in two other armor museums. And then military vehicle collector Kevin Wheatcroft's workshops in the UK, and then came back to the United States, where it was delivered to the National Armor and Cavalry Museum at Fort Benning, Georgia. Now, when we got this tank back... Um, me and Russ were there. There were some parts missing off that tank. Yeah, yeah. So when we had it, it ran. Yeah. And when we got it back, there were parts missing off it. Yeah, so that's that's crazy. I, I, I'd Just like the to, way it goes, I guess. I, I think I'd like to look at some of the other tigers yeah. that are around and kind of look and say, "Hey, uh, that, isn't that a part off of the 712?" Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I know there's a really good book on the 712. And we can get a uh, link to it. I think you can still get it on Amazon. And it's called uh, Tiger Without a Home. 
And uh, even back then, the guy was like, he could see that we were going to lose this national yeah. treasure. Yeah. You know. Anyway, Russ, go ahead with the history. Yeah, the Tiger 712, its last tactical number before capture, was built by Hinchel's Middlefield Factory between August and November of 1942. It was one of the earliest Tigers built and has the Fargastel chassis number of 250031. It also has a distinct characteristic not shared by later models. Where there would be in later Tigers a large escape hatch in the right rear of the turret, there was only a pistol port, and the same as on the left rear. The first built Tigers also had different front fenders consisting of a diamond tread plate that was later replaced by more common smooth fender with folding edges. A very, you know, distinct tank, and, you know, like I said, we're saving um, go ahead, Russ. Yeah, the Tiger was assigned to the second company of the Schwarpanzer Abdelung 501 in August of 1942. What tactical number it first boarded on the turret side is not completely known. And while the first company was shipped to Tunisia in November 1942 to join Field Marshal Erwin Rommel's Africa Corps, the second company remained in southern France. While there... Crews continued training and modifications were made to their Tigers. One modification were brackets welded to the glacis that supported spare Tiger tracks outboard of the driver's visor and the radio operator's machine gun mount. Another bracket was welded between these two points and a section of Panzer III track was stored there. At this time, all Tigers were equipped with the FIFL air cleaning system for the engine because the normal engine filters were not up for the task. But, well, like we were talking about, these filters... If you're going to run around in the desert, if you're sucking in sand, it's really, oh, yeah. it's really bad yeah. on the engine. Yeah, that'll leave you sitting pretty quick. This system provided invaluable in the dusty conditions of North Africa. The second company eventually was shipped to Tunisia and joined the rest of 501 in January 1943. Within days, it was seen its first action. In February, the battalion was integrated into the 10th Panzer Division the 1st and 2nd Companies becoming the 7th and 8th Companies of the 3rd Battalion. At this time, all vehicles' tactical numbers were changed so that the Tiger now had a tactical number beginning with 8 as the Tigers dwindled due to combat losses. All the remaining Tigers were reorganized into a single company. This is when the Tiger received its last tactical number, 712, painted in red with white outlines. The partial remains of two previous tactical numbers could be perceived in photos after its capture, 22 and 82, and the third digit being unreadable. Now, I know that the 712 crew, I, I, well, I think the officer, was uh, sent to uh, Bayfield up in Minnesota. Um, everybody's like, wait a minute, that mean Bayfield by the Apostle Islands? And I said, yeah, because they actually housed prisoners of war up there. And I'm pretty sure when they captured the 712, they sent the commander of that to Bayfield. I'm still researching that. Uh, but if you want to learn a little bit more about uh, the prisoners of war uh, from uh, Africa, West Africa, uh, you can look go to, to uh, the Bayfield dot org uh, look into that but yeah go ahead russ during combat operations the hull and turret were damaged several times there are two evident patches one on the lower front hull and one on the upper right hull side the turret was also damaged twice on the right side resulting in a square patch welded over the damage and the other cut out and patched flush on the left side there's a circular plate welded over the penetration uh, according to lynn dyer director of nacm this penetration was caused by a British 17-pounder anti-tank gun. There's also a repair to a crack in the armor next to the patch that was filled in with weld material. So, this tank saw combat. In, in fact, it, it's got a bunch of holes in it. Um, and again, the 17-pounder going right through it. As stated previously, the Tiger's chassis number is 250031, which can be found stamped in the hole. Normally in German turreted vehicles, the chassis number was also stamped inside the turret and matched the hull number. However, this Tiger's turret has a different number, 250034. There are only two possibilities. A different turret was installed on the hull at the factory, or the original turret was damaged beyond repair and replaced with a turret from another Tiger. That makes more sense. Yeah, that, I, uh, I would agree. You know, it, 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 they could have done it to the factory. You know, they're like, ah, uh, well, yeah. let's take it. But they probably would have fixed that a little bit. I agree. But, you know, this Tiger was in a lot of combat, and, and apparently 
the tiger turret was damaged so bad they just had to get another one that was just wiped out. That makes more sense. Talk about the battalion. The battalion fought until the surrender of German forces in Tunis in May of 1943. It was captured intact and still operational by Double I Corps in northern Tunisia. Colonel George B. Jarrett of the newly formed Foreign Material Section at Aberdeen Proving Grounds, Maryland, took possession of the Tiger, and it, along with many other enemy vehicles and weapons, was shipped to the United States for evaluation. We're learning, or at that time, the Americans were learning about the German tanks. and yeah, the enemy know, tanks, yeah. Yeah, and, and yeah. they're like... Okay, let's bring one back and see how we can kill this thing better. The 76 millimeter tank came, uh, gun uh, came out. Exactly. The Tiger went under intensive evaluation during the war, taken apart and put back together. After the war, the Tiger became an ordnance artifact along with other captured material and exhibited in the engineering building at Aberdeen Proving Grounds. In 1947, Colonel Jarrett, now chief of the Foreign Materials Branch, wanted to develop displays of the captured equipment. The Tiger, along with several other German vehicles, had section of its armor cut out so that spectators could see inside. See, that's what they're saying? Yeah. But... Uh, yeah, it was for training purposes, It, it was for training. Yeah. In the mid-1960s, as the Vietnam War escalated, ordnance needed the engineering building so all of the exhibited vehicles were placed outside. Heavy gauge metal screens were welded over the openings to prevent vandalism, but did nothing to keep out the elements. Eventually, sheet metal was welded over the openings, and their Tiger 712 and other vehicles and weapons set in the open field for years, slowly deteriorating. Didn't people realize? Oh, I know. Yeah. It's, that's sad. You know, like we've said, once this Tiger 712 is gone, Yes. The, the, there's no coming back. They scrapped this thing. We've just lost yeah. a, a huge part of history. That's why we're so into what Rob Kogan's doing down there now and, and, and trying to get all this turned around and fixing these things up for future generations to see and to train on. And, and some of these uh, streamers that I, uh, I mentioned every once in a while, like uh, Rita Gamer, um, she's big into re restoring tanks. Uh, she's actually um, gotten you know went into tanks and armored vehicles and helped clean it up you know taking off rust and everything uh sofa lynn she's she streams and tries to raise money and awareness yes um it all matters folks yeah ed harris um from the uk and craig moore you know they write books and they do videos and everything and, and that's why we're trying to do it you know yeah. we're trying to save yeah. these tanks and, yeah. and i know it sounds like we're begging for money but guys if it's, i had it i i would send it uh, you know i have sent I money there yeah because of budget constraints the only maintenance the vehicles received was the occasional coat of paint over the years, the tanks and guns sank into the ground until around 1987, and concrete pads were poured to support them. In 1989, Ordnance Museum Director Dr. William F. Atwater was contacted by the Auto and Technik Museum in Germany with an offer to transport Tiger 712, a Martyr II, and a Panzer IIF to the museum where the vehicles would be restored and exhibited for 10 years. While regulations on the handling and transfer of historic artifacts may have been skirted, Dr. Atwater kept the Tiger and the other vehicles out of the elements for 10 years. Okay, so, you know, the Marauder and the Panzer II F, these are some of the other tanks that uh, Rob is trying to get down now. And, mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. After 10 years had elapsed and it was ready for the vehicles to return to the United States, rumor had it that the Germans were reluctant to let the Tiger go because they had no other example of this rare vehicle and wanted to keep the cosmetically restored vehicle out of the elements at Aberdeen Proving Ground. Eventually, UK military vehicle collector Kevin Wheatcroft was enlisted to secure and transport the vehicles back to his shops in England in exchange for being allowed for an unspecified time to study and copy parts of the Tiger for his Tiger One restoration. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We, uh, so, I, uh, I mean, you know, essentially... Without the Tiger 712, yeah, the one at Bovington may not even exist. Well, <laughs> maybe eventually, but they could have come up uh, we, with the parts. We are not accusing Mr. Wheatcroft of any foul doing. I'm sure he stuck exactly yes. per his agreement and didn't take any parts or yeah. anything. But uh, uh, we are uh, saying that he did a great thing for yeah. us. He he was able to get it out of Germany and bring it back to yes, us. Yes, exactly. So we, we say legally, we are positive that he didn't do anything yeah. like that. But go ahead. 
Almost immediately, AFV enthusiasts decried this development, uh, questioning Mr. Wheatcroft's motives and filling the internet with the accusations that he intended to keep the tiger. After the BRAC mandated movement of the Patton Museum collection to Fort Benning, Georgia, and the Aberdeen Proving Ground collection to Benning and Fort Lee, Virginia, the Center for Military History requested of Mr. Wheatcroft an early return of the Tiger I and other vehicles. After the legalities and recompensation had been worked out, the Panzer II and Martyr II arrived at Fort Benning in June of 2012. Lynn Dyer traveled to England in July 2012 to oversee the collection of the Tiger and its parts and to prepare them for shipment back to the United States. In the fall, the Tiger and several boxes of components were delivered to the National Armor and Cavalry Museum where it resides today. This is why that they're trying to raise money. The 712 was stripped down. Exactly. Like he said, there yes. were several boxes. Yeah. And everybody says, well, why don't you just get the parts and put them on? I'm sorry, is there anybody out there in the world that's that, left that can that, do that? That's left yes. that can do that. Yeah. You know what? And if you can do it, please give Rob a holler. I'm yes. sure he will let you come on base and piece yes. it all together. Rob? And if you actually seen our uh, post we put on Facebook here just a few days ago about what they're looking for right. down there, I mean, it, it's it's they're looking for somebody right now that can actually do that and put tanks together, take them apart and put them together. Well, everybody says, well, you know, I'm sure Rob ha- has his own mechanic. Well, his mechanic, we talked about in our prior episodes, went up to Wyoming to help on that private. And, you know, if you're going to make money, you got to go to the private side. So we don't, we're not mad at that no, guy for no. leaving. No, but no, here's but Rob, yeah. probably one of the smartest guys in the world, yeah, and, and one of the best dressers. <laughs> I, I agree, I agree. The, the man was in a three piece suit and I he know. was leading us through muck and mire yeah. in the rain, so yeah. we, pouring well, down rain that props day to yeah. him and uh, missing dinner, too. I know, I know, and uh, you know, having boxes of these tank parts just laying there. Put, I, I put a t- tiger tank together as a model, oh, but I, I wouldn't know the first thing wow. I had to put the tracks on or but but if you do Rob, rob's looking for rob's you rob's looking for you because they're looking for guys <laughs> now a battle we know the 712 was in uh was that the battle for hill 727 or the battle of conical hill uh, west africa there's not a lot about that uh, i actually had to check on that prisoner of war um stuff that i found uh up there by the apostle islands but go ahead and talk about uh, 712's combat action. Yeah, at daylight on January 31st, Company G suddenly found themselves on the receiving end of a furious assault by German mountain troops. Elements of 344th Infantry Division, together with armored support, launched a coordinated attack on Hill 727 and the British 5th Buffs Battalion on the left flank. The company was hit from three angles by the German infantry, whom were also receiving air support via several FW-190 fighters. Have you ever seen pictures of those I FW-190s? I've probably seen them, but not realized what it was. They are yeah. some of the coolest looking airplanes you've ever seen. I'll we'll, definitely have to go and look that up now. Well, let's try to add a picture of that on okay. our Facebook. The American GIs held on to Hill 727 until about noon after its supporting machine guns and mortars had been destroyed. Following the loss of the support weapons, Company G pulled back to a second hill behind their current position, but were soon forced from this feature and pulled back to a third hill. Here they managed to hold their ground against the ferocious German assault. So these guys are getting pushed back. If you get kicked three hills back, you're in trouble. Yes. You know, you've lost all your heavy machine guns, you've lost your mortars. Okay. Yeah. And you've got Tiger Tank 712 just kind of shooting at you. It's time to move. The 5th Buffs Battalion proved invaluable in stopping the German assault on the left flank thanks to their attached anti-tank section, number 2 troop of A Battery, 72nd Anti-Tank Regiment. During the attack, the British managed to destroy a total of seven German tanks, including three Mark VI Tiger tanks, and after the anti-tank elements managed to score several flanking shots with six-pounder anti-tank guns. One of the Tigers suffered a total of six penetrating shots into its side armor before being knocked out. The Germans tried another attack on the British at 2100 hours, but this was easily repulsed. However, the enemy did did manage to remove all but three of their knocked out tanks in this action. So... We were talking about these 17-pounders and their six-pounder uh, guns, and the British are just lighting them up and shooting them down and killing them. 
So some of the Tigers that were damaged, uh, we were almost positive was the 712, and they brought it back because they were able to save them, except two, right? Yeah. Although there are conflicting reports as to whether this was done by the German forces or British engineers, the single Mark VI tank left on the battlefield was destroyed by explosives before the British could capture and examine it. Well, I, I don't think the British engineers would have went out there and blown up a Tiger tank. They did capture it. I think they would have captured it, yeah. You know, uh, they, they were trying to get their hands on it. Sure. And, and that was German policy. You know, don't let these Tigers fall into enemy hands. I'm going to go with the Germans did it. Yeah. But uh, in this battle where all these Tigers were getting knocked out, these Panzer Sixes and everything, uh, 712 was in it. And that's probably where all these holes came from. I agree, yes. So, you know, God bless the British, you know. I guess the Americans were getting pounded, and the, I guess the British pounded them back. Let's talk about the tiger phobia. You know, everybody says, oh, when they saw the tiger tank, uh, the Americans and everybody were scared of them, and the Soviets were scared of them, and they'd run away from them and stuff like that. And, and the, basically, people call it tiger phobia. It, it wasn't really as common as you think. Um, the tiger's ability to terrorize enemy troops tends to be somewhat exaggerated. Uh, many stories of the British or American or Soviet tankers refusing to engage tigers reflect different tactical doctrines rather than fear. What do you think? Allied fighting vehicles were simply not supposed to engage panzers in gunnery duels, and that was the artillery's job. If a Sherman crew sighted a tiger, they were trained to radio the position to the artillery and Get the hell out of there, essentially. Furthermore, with the tiger being such a rare sight on the battlefield, avoiding confrontations with them was a sound strategy. Uh, Allied troops just had to keep their heads down and hope that the tiger didn't do too much damage before it ran out of fuel and returned to base. So, when they say, well, they were running from the tigers, that's their orders. They were ordered, hey, do not fight these things. Let our artillery guys... Yes, you guys can kill it. Yes, you your thing. But we don't need you to risk getting killed. You know, that's the difference between the guy in the tank and the guy in the command. He's like, I need you out here destroying machine gun nests and supporting the infantry and everything. Yes, I know you can go kill tigers. We can, we can do that. But if you back off and do your job like I'm ordering you to and radio in to our air force and artillery and let them handle it, I don't have to worry about you getting killed. I'm trying to save your life. Uh, makes sense to me. It, it really does. Yeah, it makes sense to me, too. Uh, that is not to say that the tiger wasn't scary, but the same could be said of pretty much any large fighting vehicle. Uh, tanks, after all, are giant armored beasts bristling with machine guns and cannons. As one Soviet veteran uh, put it, when you're crouched in a trench... Everything, every tank looks like a Tiger tank. Well, sure it would, yeah. Yeah, they were undoubtedly occasions when tank crews fled or abandoned uh, posts to escape Tigers. You know, we know that, but and sometimes endangering their comrades in the process. But this was not an epidemic problem. Uh, typically, Allied commanders and Soviet commanders had more of a problem with excessive bravery. Um, Shermans or like the Soviet T-34s, uh, they'd launch doom attacks. Doom charges against tigers. They did, you know, they did this with no fear or cowardice. You know, there's documented uh, things where people saw the Sherman or the tiger and they ran. I think we even talk about the comet. Instead of radioing that in and having their artillery hit it, they came out the next day, drove around True, the side yeah. of it, and shot it shot and killed it. it. Yeah. If you're the commander, what are you telling your guys? Do not take your T-34s. Do not take your Shermans. Do not take your comets. And charge these tanks. The, you know, the, this tiger is They've usually... got other resources that would take care of them. Yeah. As long as they had the position of the tanks. But these Shermans and, and the, even, even these Soviet T-34s, there's tons of them just flat out charging tiger tanks and you know, yeah. the, you know from the front. And that's not cowardice. That's no. not fear. Nope. You know, they're out there trying to save other soldiers, yeah. other tankers. I think that would be more of the problem telling your guys don't go after these tigers and i'm sure some of our americans were like hey i want to i want, a, I want the fame yeah. i want the fame exactly you know uh, a fame can override cowardice a yeah. lot so there's a couple of guys out there i'm going to be the babe ruth of uh, tank driving i'm going to kill me a couple of tigers and get to be famous so yeah. so these you know this command staff saying 
stop. I'm telling you, when you see an actual tiger, back off and let our artillery just blow the hell out of it. Oh, well, such is life, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, the plan is to restore it, and it's going to cost about, what, $500,000? Yeah. Um, it, it, it needs it. It does. I agree. Yeah, and like I said, we are going to come up with a letter writing uh, plan for the President Trump and see if we can't get the president. Uh, I know he, for his 4th of July thing, had said that the new Shermans were coming out. And, and he he was mistaken. He, you know, knows the Sherman. Everybody knows the Sherman tank. He meant the Abrams. Yeah. And, and the Abrams were there. And, yeah. and it's a common mistake. Anybody that says, oh, no, no, I never make a mistake about, you know, tanks or anything like that, you're full of it. Because yeah. we make mistakes all the time. <laughs> But he said all these Shermans, you know what I would have done? I would have called Rob. And he probably didn't even know about Rob. Yeah. And I would have said, hey, Rob, I need my Shermans up here. Yeah. <laughs> and I bet you having all those out there, you yeah. know, people would be going, uh, we need to throw some more money at that. I know. So we're trying to get private funds for the Tiger 712. But we want to do a letter writing cam- campaign to try to get some big federal funding yeah. for all the tanks. For all the, the got down there that they're working on because... Because even if me and you hit the lottery yeah. tomorrow with $180 million. Oh, it wouldn't even touch it, it. You know, we could paint yeah. them and maybe yeah. build a building, but yeah. not, not what it needs. Especially for the next 100 years. Exactly. Well, this has been a great episode. I had a lot of fun. Yeah, me too. Uh, we hope you guys had a lot of fun. Um, let's go ahead and wrap it up, Russ. Yeah, as always, you can contact us through our email address at twotankersandcat at gmail.com. Find us on Facebook. Just do a search in the facebook search bar for two tankers and a cat podcast make sure you give us a like on facebook and keep up with all the happenings and everything with the podcast on there feedback and your comments and please don't forget that you can leave us a voicemail at 785-380-9844 and we will actually get your comments your audio comments from your voicemail onto our next podcast I mean, even if it comes down to leaving us what you want to hear next. Yeah. I mean, give us some ideas of what you folks want to hear. And look, look at Andy. He said, hey, I'm going to throw you a couple of bucks. Uh, will you do one on the sure. comment? Sure. We're like, yep, buddy. Hey, we'll, for you. are right. Yeah. Yeah, we appreciate yeah. your money, and we'll do an episode on the comment. We'll take care of you. That was, that was a good episode. Yeah, it was. Well, until next time, this is Charlie. And this is Russell. And as always, happy tanking, and have a great week. Yeah.